Okay. Nope. Welcome to a brand new season of Thursdays with Third Path webinars. This year, we will be exploring the eight major crossroads we all have to navigate when integrating work and life. And on today's call, I have the honor of launching the year with Peter Senge. You will quickly learn how his work around systems thinking deeply influenced what we do at Third Path Institute, both around how systems can limit our options, but also when you find the right leverage point, how it can dramatically influence the system. To help illustrate these important concepts, we have asked two parents to join us and talk about how they've pushed back at some outdated systems to find a more satisfying approach to work and life. And like all of our Thursday webinars, we hope today's discussion will inspire you to take the next step towards your own unique third path and integrated approach to work and life. So welcome. We are so glad you are here with us today, Peter. Um, we've had you on a couple of times, uh, uh, you know, partly because your work is really just so important to what we do at Third Path. Um, there are clearly huge systems that influence both work and life. Um, and, you know, way back when I founded Third Path Institute, I read your book, uh, The Fifth Discipline, and it just helped me learn very quickly if we wanted to make big change, we needed to look for a good leverage point for change. So I'm going to put up a couple slides about, you know, what is systems thinking and we'll get, get people started on that. But there might be something you want to say before I get started on talking about systems, Peter. I want to give you the floor first. Oh, well, thanks, Jessica. Um, no, I don't think there's too much I need to say up front. I think it, in many ways it's it's always about the context and the particular questions. And I think you guys um, really have a, a good idea of what it is you want to focus on today. Right. I mean, it's, right. it's been a long, long journey and it's about interconnectedness. And right. I'll turn it back to you. Great. Super. All right. Well, again, there's a lot more you could say about the fifth discipline than what these three bullet points. Um, but that, you know, uh, one of the things I learned when reading this book many years ago was how, you know, some of the problems we're encountering today are from the solutions that we thought of were great solutions a while ago. Um, another important point is that you don't always notice cause and effect in a system. Um, so if you think about a system as like a garden, um, and you know, garden, in order for a garden to work well, you need water, uh, you need sun, but it, the soil can also impact the garden. And so you know, if you've had some sort of bad things happen in the soil, uh, you might not see it right away, but later on the garden might be impacted. So there isn't always a, an immediate cause and effect in how a system works. Um, and then the big point that you can look for a leverage point for change around how to influence a system and improve the system. So by maybe adding the better nutrients to the soil, you're going to get a better um, you know, vegetable crop the following summer. And Third Path has really looked for leverage points for change. Uh, one big leverage point right from the start was getting men involved with family, uh, making it not a women's issue, but an everybody issue. Um, and another leverage point, and this one hasn't always has been easy to show, as we supported professionals over the course of their careers, they then became integrated leaders. And it turns out integrated leaders, I believe, are a critical leverage point for change to really create 21st century organizations. So actually, before I go on to the next slide, there might be something else you want to add about systems, um, you know, another point that you think is important or, or why men or leaders are an important part of making change in this system. What do you think, Peter? Well, I think the points you just made are really quite fundamental. Um, I just one little caveat. I always worry about this. The word system is really a, not a very good word. I mean, I think what you're talking about now um, is, is really about the nature of, of reality in the sense of it being complex, interdependent, continually unfolding. Um, and we, we use the word system, systems thinking, really because they have uh, such long lineage in the Western scientific perspective. Um, but of course, for most people, when they hear the word system, they think, you know, it's not my fault, it's the stupid system, right? It's the rules, the, the bureaucracy, all that. Or nowadays, of course, more and more people think, oh, computer system, neither of which is what this is meant to kind of point at. Right. It's more an innate understanding of interconnectedness. Yes. So um, that's just a small kind of clarification, but it's always useful, particularly when people go out from a conversation like this and want to communicate to others. Uh, 
I, I would always use the word system advisedly, right? right? Recognize what you're trying to communicate may not be what people hear. Right, right. Well, those are great words. Complex, interconnected, continually unfolding. Um, that's, I think, what spoke to me when I was reading your book uh, so many years ago is that, that that's the truth of work and family and, right. and how much change has been happening over the since my daughter was born 26 years ago. Boy, has there been a lot of change around both work right. and around family um, in both systems, the family system and the work system. Wonderful. Thank you for those clarifying points. They're good ones. So one one slide i'm going to take some time to explain and then i want to get your thoughts about it peter because this is this is an unexpected consequence and that can happen in systems um too you kind of go in one direction thinking this is going to be a great thing you know being able to have uh, uh email and smartphones we think is going to be a really great thing but there sometimes are unintended uh, consequences inside of a system when there's a change um, and so what i'm trying to show in this picture is a couple of really important points. Again, if we think about my daughter born 26 years ago, I was graduating from Wharton, and I remember very specifically talking to somebody about the invention of email. It was literally just happening back then, 1990, it was 1994, so she was like two years old. So was telling me about email, and I'm like, wow, email. I thought faxes was exciting. This email thing sounds really exciting. And so here I was, you know, starting off in a world that was going to dramatically change in a very short amount of time around how connected, how interconnected we would become uh, around work in particular. And so what I'm trying to show in this picture, as we fast forward to today, what I didn't know was that the people Third Path has been working with, I'm going to circle them. These are the people who've kind of figured out how to put a boundary around their work and life selves and say to themselves, you know what? How much can I really handle at work? How much can I really handle at home? And if I'm intentional about that, I will feel like I'm more satisfied with how things are going. And most importantly, they're going to have this green area that I talk about as time to recharge. So when I started working with people who were kind of following this integrated path uh, 16 years ago, what I didn't know is that they were going to be very, very smart about how to kind of think in a world that where you could be connected everywhere all the time around work and instead make some wise choices about how much they wanted to be connected. So they had time for family. They had time for their lives. They had time to recharge, hence the visual of a battery. What do you think about that, Peter? Um, does that ring any familiar bells? Well, I mean, one way to interpret what you're saying right now, Jessica, is, you know, who chooses the boundary? Yeah. I mean, um, if if we don't choose the boundaries that make the most sense for what matters to us, uh, technology chooses for us. Or <laughs> technology and the norms of our workplace choose for us. Yeah. I just thought email was uh, totally crazy at some level. And, you know, obviously we can add to it now all the messaging text messaging and so on, all the ways we can kind of be in touch, you know, instantaneously with us. And and basically, another way to say it is that, uh, do we let the speed of electrons make the choices for us, which is actually pretty fast, or do we kind of recognize that, no, actually, we're, we actually are a biological and social system, not a, uh, a, 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 a electronic, you know, s system. We're, we're based on carbon, not silicon. Yeah. You know, so it, it uh, a man of mine used to say this wonderful years ago. He said, you know, it takes nine months to have a baby. It doesn't matter how many people you put on the job. So <laughs> we, don't, we don't appreciate, you know, our own kind of, you might say, biological foundations, which in turn kind of shape our, our, our emotional and personal reality. Then the external reality will make the choice for us, you know. So as soon as people start to think, well, you should respond to every message within, you know, 30 minutes or maybe it's five minutes or else people won't like you anymore, you're dead. Yeah. Because then, you know, there's another facet of this whole messaging phenomenon, email messaging, well, I'm just choosing messaging as a generic term, which is it's a self-reinforcing process, right? Mm -hmm. If you respond right away, somebody else responds. Before you know it, that little feedback loop takes off. 
And what could have been, you know, one very short exchange becomes 25 messages. Yes. And then if we're operating in the norm, and that's the whole point of this and the point I think you were making, if we were operating based on the norm that should always respond immediately, then we're caught in a system which is not a system that we've chosen. We've caught a system created, again, by the combination of technology and a set of shared social norms. So I, I love your diagram. I think ultimately we really can choose boundaries. Yeah. But it takes a good amount of courage. I mean, I don't have to belabor this to you. I mean, you know, and people, you know, here know that, you know, to do that, you have to have some real clarity, personal clarity. You have to have some courage. And ultimately, you have to communicate. I mean, a lot of people know that, you know, I will not respond to messages very quickly. Fine. I always make sure the people I want to make sure know how to reach me can always find a way to get something through. But uh, please don't expect to hear back from me right away. And, and you know, that helps maintain a certain sanity. So that's your little boundary. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen again. Um, and and that I, I think I really didn't know. I mean, I'm going to make a wild and crazy statement here. Here I was trying to just help people think about how to do work and family in a way where they were feeling more satisfied. But I would make the statement that, um, you know, in a sense, they were really developing what I would call 21st century skills. They were really learning. Right. Yeah. Because they wanted to have that human side available to them, but they also wanted to be effective at work. And, you know, going back to what Lottie Balin taught me around the same time, they were learning how to be smarter. So you right. figured out how to have people get a, a hold of you in a way that was useful for them, but useful for you. Um, and that's what we really saw in these integrated people. Wonderful. Well, there's and lots. It, of, go ahead. It always, starts, it always starts with some real reflection on what matters to me, yeah. because all of this is just kind of intellectual until it gets to a point and go, no, Here's the things that matter to me. Here's what I want my little battery to look like. Yeah. Here's what I experience with my kids. To like. And that's the foundation. Technology is not the foundation. Technology is always just an enabler. It yeah. can enable useful stuff. It can enable some very non-useful stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's what we're going to be exploring all year long is kind of looking at each part of this. Um, over the course of, of the of the year, because again, um, I have this amazing group of integrated life advocates. So they're career counselors, couples counselors who help us kind of do our work, other people who are excited about helping us make change. And what they reminded me as I prepared for this year's call was that this to choose an integrated approach is something you have to keep on choosing over and over again um, because of some outdated norms, because technology will, you know, take over our lives if we let it. So in fact, I want to show that as the next slide about even early in your career, uh, these are some choices that you can start making. So I'm going to put the next slide up in a second. Before I do that, the reason I have the batteries floating in blue, again, is to remind us work will take over. Um, right. and, we, and we need to kind of be smart in today's world where we could work everywhere all the time. We need to get smarter about how to work in a way that really makes sense, that reflects our what matters to us, as, as Peter said. So, all right. So um, before we get to talking about early career, uh, again, I'm sure you've seen this in your work, Peter. Lottie Balin has taught me this in her work. Um, so many smart people at MIT, what can I tell you? Uh, so, you know, that what we also saw over the last couple of years is that when you have a team, or an organization where people are not smart around how to kind of manage these boundaries better, that there's a, a probability that that team or that organization will go into what we call chronic overwork mode. And there's a long list of things that aren't very healthy for organizations in chronic overwork mode. I've listed some of them below. The most obvious one is that becomes a, a sense of fire drill. You're just going from fire drill to fire drill and you never can actually say, hmm, what could we do to avoid the fire drill because you're all just in reactive mode. Does this ring bells for you, this kind of chronic overwork and 24 seven culture, work culture problem? Yeah, I think you're pointing to uh, something that kind of extends what I was saying a minute ago that while we understand this or we experience it, let's say, at the personal level, it's part of a larger network of interconnections yep. and that um, it, it will it will self-reinforce in directions that none of us want uh, if there aren't enough of us who kind of say, no, no, here, here are the things that matter to me. Here's some of the ways I want to see this system work. 
One of my friends at MIT was actually one of the inventors of email. I was thinking about this when you were first telling that story. <laughs> and, and he was really good. He had this wonderful analogy. He said, no, I don't answer all my emails. I answer some. I kind of know about how many I want to do a day, and that's what I do. And he, then he said, you know, and he said, this was something that came to me in the early days when we were first inventing email. He said, if you drive by a library, you really shouldn't feel compelled to go in and read every book. <laughs> nice. It's yeah. that kind of, you know, personal comfort. Yep. Yeah. I'll yeah. get back to you. And, you know, this could be as literally as simple as saying, you know, here's how many emails I'll do a day, but probably more. Here's how much time I want to spend. That's it. No more. Yep. But then, of course, you've got to manage that interface. That's what your diagram here is pointing out. That, of course, is an interface with all your other colleagues and the larger work culture. So, um, they like so many things, at one level, this is a very personal matter. If it doesn't start at the personal level, nothing much happens. But at another level, it's not just personal. Yeah. It's collective. So yeah. how we kind of create the norms we want to create as opposed to just be have them imposed upon us. But there's a we there. And I think that's partly what your picture here is, is kind of suggesting with this bigger feedback loop. Yeah. Yes, it's, about you, but it's not only about me. Yeah. And here's another, uh, just to take it one step further. So, um, you know, there is kind of the we, but then what also we are starting to see, because again, thir Third Path has been at this for 16 years now. So we've known people for a long time yeah. and we've kind of seen over time, how does this play out? And, uh, and unfortunately, that, that yep. collective experience makes people feel bad if they're trying to set limits when actually what we've been trying to say for 16 years is no, no, no. When you look for a way to set a limit that's thoughtful for the organization and thoughtful for you, everybody benefits. But right. pe people don't feel that. They feel a pressure to conform, especially because there's some assumptions around who's the better worker. Better workers work longer hours. Better workers say yes to everything. And unfortunately, this plays out in a very gendered way, typically. Not always. And that's one reason why we're going to hear one of our stories today. Um, but it, it has lots of this, this uh, self-reinforcing system can go, take us in a direction that's not very satisfying for very many people, I guess, is the bottom line, absolutely. if we let it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. absolutely right. And, and your comment there, um, this can unfold in very traditional gendered ways. I mean, I, I think that the thing to keep in mind is when we're conforming or when we're acting in a way which is compliant to larger expectations, we're doing nothing to cause people, I and others, to reflect on those expectations or those larger norms. So in a sense, we're becoming complicit in maintaining traditional norms yeah. like gender norms. Yeah. Because the only way those to change is they have to be brought to some level of explicitness. Yep. And when one or a small group of people stand up and say, wait a second, we actually don't agree. This is what really matters to us. You can, if you do it well, start a process of reflection. And that process of reflection will bring these deeper norms out into the open. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh, what a great setup for when Matt Schneider talks. Thank you so much. That's great. Because you'll see he's taken his own personal life and he's really making some big changes for others. So, um, Matt, I'm going to be really fun to hear you talk about this. So, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but I'm just pointing out that even when we start our careers, we can start being um, uh, influenced by the system by so many factors. Um, you know, you, you enter a workplace and it looks like, you know, People think, oh, young people, they don't have other responsibilities, so they're the ones we can ask to work late. Yeah. Or, or, the, or money, how money plays out. You know, they, they, people are graduating with huge debt, um, and that's a lot of pressure. And so they might choose the higher paying job, or they might choose to work long hours so they get more rewards to pay off yeah. that debt, you know? And so the, even as we enter this system after college, we're starting to make choices that might reinforce uh, our or, 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 or limit our ability to push back at the system. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about this year is wait, wait, wait. There's a ways to do this differently right from the start of your of your career. None required. But any thoughts about the idea that right when you start your career, this could either hinder you or make some choices up more up available to you. What do you think about that, Peter? Well, I think you kind of have illustrated or, or painted the picture clearly of the dilemma. Yeah. You know, you're a young person. Obviously, it's very natural. You're trying to prove yourself. You have various 
pressures like the financial ones you illustrate. But conversely, uh, have you been around a lot of workplaces? Um, I think almost a definition of a good workplace. Now, this is, of course, not every workplace, but almost a definition of a good one. And, and many have some element of this. You want young people who really know who they are. Yeah. And have a sense of themselves. Yeah, sure, I'm committed to the work. But I'm also committed to something beyond just the work. It helps everybody. And I think that I look at the young people who've had a big in impact in our kind of projects and so on without exception oh sure they work hard but they also are very very good and you know who they are so a slightly different way to say all this is do you do you create a space around you in your work where you and others are appreciating who you are as a as an idiosyncratic not you know another kind of you know round peg to fit in round holes yeah but as an idiosyncratic person you actually do have families and friends and relationships. You actually do care about things that include but go beyond your work setting. And you do have a certain sense, I mean, in our work, particularly today, I say that something that's maybe a little bit new, is excited to appreciate and workplaces to appreciate, you do have a kind of, let's just say, a developmental element of your life. Yes. It's not just about how much money you make and where you, what you've accomplished, kind of serve, but there's a kind of a set of ideals you bring about your own development and growth as a human being. I think good workplaces really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, and that is a great topic we're gonna look at at our very next webinar because that I think is a core truth. If you help young people get clear about who they are as whole people and encourage them right. to keep on developing themselves as whole people, uh, that they will get uh, naturally better and better at thinking about how to how to approach work in a way where it's part of their life, but not the only defining part of their life and make wiser yeah. choices. Yeah. And, and I'm saying things that I know it's kind of cornerstone for your work is that that has changed. Yeah. I think more and more young people have that orientation already. Yes. And, work, and the workplaces who honor it and learn how to work with it become the places people want to work. Yes. Good point too. Really well said. Yep. Well, and again, the theme of this year's webinars is talking about how it's not a decision once to make an integrated life, but it's a decision over and over again. Um, and so along comes a baby. And uh, yes, this is a classic place where it becomes very challenging to think outside the systems because you have the family system and the work system sending you very right. strong messages about what you're supposed to do there as a woman, as a man, as an ideal worker. Um, and by the way, you're exhausted and you've never been a parent before. And, you know, you're not a parent for a year. You're a parent for a long, a lifetime. Um, and right. so <laughs> it's all these. And by the way, you still need money and you're still facing these work norms and life norms. And so you're trying to figure it all out. And that's what we're going to get to today is to talk a little bit about some. We have some real life stories here that we'll be sharing that help illustrate some people who thought outside the box around this. So. We won't talk a lot about this one in a second. Instead, I want to put up one other slide and then we're going to get your thoughts on, on the family. Um, one of the things we've learned at Third Path is that, uh, yes, we imagine a future where uh, households uh, do have two parents who can work in a way where they have plenty of time and energy for their families. And we call those household shared care families, you know, whether it's two dads, two moms, mom and dad, divorced parents. Both parents are thinking in a way where they're doing work and they have time for energy, time and energy for their family, time and energy for themselves, time and energy to recharge. I think what I've seen, again, since uh, starting Third Path 16 years ago is that there's um, unfortunately a, another unintended consequence is another kind of family out there where they're both working and, uh, and in a very rigid work system and then they come home to family exhausted. And then they have to, you know, come home at the witching hour with kids are hungry, they're hungry, get the kids fed, get them bed, get, you know, start the whole day again the next day. And then on the weekends, they do their errands okay. and then they do it all over again on Monday. And okay. I, I have to tell you, this is the one family system I'm most anxious for, because I think what happens is those family systems don't realize how much the workplace is asking too much of them. And they take it out inside the smaller family system. Um, in stress and arguments, um, and it's it's very tough on families. 
Um, what do you what do you think about all this? How family plays out in these systems? Any thoughts about that, Peter? Well, in one way, it comes right back to what we were talking about before, but now it's it's really a couple, or it's a it's a it's a two uh, house two worker household. Yeah. Um, I think that you know the the trap of we can both you know be fully pursuing our careers and we make enough money that now we can hire additional help. Um, it's fine to a degree. You know, we all seen settings where that can work pretty well, but I think it only works to the degree that you've got all three of these elements. In other words, and and how much time do we have just ourselves? Yeah. And how much time do we have just with the kids? Um, I mean, I always think that kids are a wonderful ally, but you got to listen to them. The problem is parents are busy <laughs> only to themselves. But you know, the one thing I've always found found about kids is, you know, you're either there or you're not. Yeah. And they actually don't care what you were doing when you weren't there. So you could say, you know, well, I had dinner. The, the CEO of my company wanted to have dinner. They go, okay, fine. But it doesn't matter to them if it was the CEO of your company or it was something more to you mundane. You're either there or you're not there. And I always find that really grounds things. Yeah. You know, it, small example of one of the gifts of children. Children can ground adults. The problem is we're too damn busy to listen to them and we don't really take in their perspective. And then, of course, de facto, we impose our perspective. Yeah. So, yeah, we make enough money. We can have somebody around to help. I think that's perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's that then that displaces the fact that, no, we could actually be there ourselves doing, quote, nothing together, what you call the time to recharge yeah. and time with family together. See. I, I don't think this is a management problem. I think it's a choice problem. You know, right. it comes, that's why I say it loops back to what we were talking before. You know, how important is it for us to have time to do nothing but hang out right. with, with each other, with the kids, and with ourselves? Right. So, it, I mean, I think that's one reason your battery. Yeah. Your battery was a great metaphor. It always yeah. keeps coming up to the same thing. Yeah. 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 No, thank you. And, and again, and not that third path thinks there's a wrong answer here. The answer is helping families get clear about what's the right thing for them and to not what we will talk about later, not lower their vision, because there are very powerful forces that kind of push us in a direction. And, and you know, going back to what you said earlier, what matters to us? What matters to me? What matters to you? What matters to our kids? How do we set this up in a way that makes sense? And how can we really find a great leverage point for change around this? So that's where Matt comes in. Matt, you have an amazing story personally, but you've done something with this much bigger than you too. Um, obviously, a big lever point for change is to change norms around who does what in family. So tell us a little bit about how you did that personally. Um, and then, you know, you know, a few minutes or less, also how it's uh, changed what you're doing. Uh, in a larger way with other dads. Welcome, Matt. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, I think I go back to the conversations my then girlfriend, now wife, and I were having before we even thought about getting married and was what do we have our life look like? And we were thinking about money. We were thinking about where we want to live. We we're thinking about whether we wanted to have kids. Um, and those conversations I think, have led to the choices that we've made along the way. Um, we did decide to move to New York City uh, because of my wife's job. I was able to transfer my job from Boston to New York um, before we had kids, uh, but her job was was going to be the one that we, we put as priority um, by moving to New York City because her job is in finance, and that's the kind of job you need to have uh, to, to live the way that we wanted to live in New York City. So uh, that that choice uh, led us along the way to uh, having kids and how could we have kids in New York City um, and stay here, uh, which led to our choice to me for me to take a step back from my career uh, and into my role as full-time at-home dad, which at the time I thought would be uh, for a few years while my children were young. Uh, Twelve years later, I'm still at home uh, with now two boys that uh, seem to need need an at-home parent more than they did even when, when they were newborns and toddlers. So um, we continue to look at our life and... Uh, uh, adjust uh, 
our roles, uh, what each of us is doing. Uh, I am at home. I am doing the laundry. I'm doing the cooking and and the childcare work. I'm grocery shopping and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean my wife is any less engaged in our lives than uh, than I am. She uh, knows all of the kids, uh, teachers very well. Uh, she is she makes every attempt that she can to, to by dinner time. Um, and she, she she kind of lives with intention of of trying to find the right uh, measurements on on that battery uh, picture that you uh, yep pointed to before. Uh, in terms of how I've made this work a lot, I'd, I'd say uh, I looking back in those first few years, I felt very isolated, um, or I now look back and think about how isolated I was and. Um, that I had really lost myself. I was Max's dad for uh, for three years before Sam was born, and I was then I was Max and Sam's dad. Um, it was only until a friend of mine wanted to uh, kind of address the fact that there are there are no uh, resources for dads in New York City, uh, and I hadn't found any uh, in those three years that I was home. And and he said, uh, I'm going to be home too. Why don't we try to do something about it? So we started NYC Dads Group in uh, 2008, uh, really, as a way to uh, just find other dads that wanted to hang out. And slowly but surely, we recognized that uh, the dads that we were meeting through our meetup group were not the dads that we saw being portrayed in the media, uh, in commercials and TV and and movies, so we started uh, participating in some online conversations about uh, what dads were really doing at home and the intention that we were bringing to um, our role as dads, and not just at-home dads, working dads as well. Um, we uh, also recognized, and uh, right around this time I met Jessica, recognized that that the workplace was not serving dads. Uh, so how can we join women in, in fighting for workplace, workplaces that meet the needs of mothers and fathers uh, to give us the lives that we want to lead, allow us to still be good at our jobs, but also uh, be the, the parents that we wanna be. Um, so it's, it's a long story, but somewhere along the way, we expanded outside New York City. Uh, yeah to cities across the country. We're now in, in 30 cities across with these communities of dads uh, offline as well as online, kind of sharing our voices and, and trying to show the world uh, that we are in fact serious about uh, being dads, whether we're at home full time or in the workplace. Hmm. Isn't that great, Peter? I mean, talk about a leverage point for change. <laughs> I mean, it's... Thanks, one really quick question. Just, uh, Matt, if you wouldn't mind, you said something that I thought was really intriguing when you said that um, we quickly discovered in talking with, with each other a kind of reality, in my word, a kind of things that were not the way we were being portrayed as a group. If you could just give a quick example of that, that sounded really interesting. Uh, yes, I'll go to my favorite example. There was a commercial years ago, Huggies, the diaper company, had a, a commercial national campaign where they had filmed uh, five or six dads over a weekend in a house with their babies alone. And the tagline for the campaign was putting Huggies to the test, like a, the true test. Basically, dads having to take care of their kids by themselves, and what would happen in this in this crazy experiment that they were running, and of course the uh, the voice that they used and the the uh, what they were showing in the commercial made dads look like buffoons, and that's kind of yeah. that was so common. Um, Interesting, yeah, very and common. And luckily, uh, the a number of dads groups got together, and there's been some change around that. So there's a there's a happy ending around the influence of dads today in changing that perception. However, I have to be the timekeeper, so I'm going to march us on. Um, but really, what 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 is so powerful here is that you know that that individual uh, personal clarity that Matt had and his his family had, and he and his wife had, is creating this team at home expanded to be so much more than that of really influencing wider change, which is just um, music to my ears around 
what's happened in the last 16 years. So uh, thank you, Matt, for all that you've done. I was going to have you tell a little about how you've thought about summers as a way to kind of re recharge and recalibrate. But again, time is marching on. One of the things I've really learned from Matt is that it's not, an, it's not a simple process where you kind of say, this is how I'm going to do it. Our family's got it right. You have to keep on working at it, keep on thinking about it collectively and individually to tweak the system, find the right answer for you and your family. Um, speaking of tweaking the system, Jana, I'm so glad you're here today. Um, I have another amazing story for you guys to hear about where how we can push back at the system and hear how change can happen. So Jana, I see that you might have your mute on and I just want to make sure we hear you. Great. And I want to have you tell a little about how you've been involved with Third Path. By the way, both Jana and Matt were part of our ILA community, Integrated Life Advocates. Um, so we've really, uh, we want to encourage those listeners today to say, if you want to help make change in the world, we want to get you involved with us. But Jana, tell us a little bit about the journey you've been on and how you've pushed back at the system. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so let's see. Uh, our story is that um, Graham is my partner. You can see him waving there. And he has a fairly traditional job. Um, at a company that makes um, camping gear here in Seattle. And my job uh, was very flexible. I am a writer and I also do property management. Uh, and so that, uh, those two jobs um, were, were jobs that could easily flex around having kids, um, which was a great, has been a really, really great thing and has also had its challenges. Um, and one thing that, that was interesting, Jessica, you were saying that work will take over. And from the flexing parents um, perspective, I would also argue that family will take over too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and especially, um, I'm curious to hear Matt's perspective on this, but as a mother, there are a lot of um, kind of assumptions we make about what a good mother looks like, what she does. Um, and there's kind of this, um, there are very high expectations for mothers um, these days. And uh, so Graham and I got into a situation where um, uh, uh, I guess I felt like we weren't on, this, on the same team with the, with the kids. And, um, and it was very easy to fall into habits where because I was the flexing parent, who was picking kids up and um, that kind of thing, then it was easy just to continue kind of being the point person uh, for the kids and for the home, even when he was around. So um, I got involved with Third Path uh, during a time when I was trying to wrestle with that and make changes around that. And, um, you know, one thing that I've, I've read some some of Peter's work, and one of the fundamental changes for us was moving from discussing our issues and our patterns to kind of dialoguing about them. Uh, and when we were discussing things, we'd each be arguing our own side and getting lots of defensiveness and reactivity up. And when we could finally step back and say, well, what do we actually want? What do we want this to look like and feel like? Um, that was a good, a good place to be to actually make some changes in um, how we ran our family. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, I think an important part of the journey that um, I've been on and you and I have certainly talked about is this concept I mentioned really briefly early in the process um, you know, uh, again, something from the fifth discipline. Um, there's a whole section about, you know, if we want in this, in the, in this case, the family system to change, there's some personal mastery we need to learn. And there's some mastery need, we need to learn some new ways we need to learn for our, for our family system. Um, and that there can, it can be, it can sometimes feel, uh, discouraging because you have this kind of vision of what you want but then you have the current reality of how things are going. And the way Peter talked about this in his book was that, you know, imagine a rubber band between your hand that's the vision and your hand that's the current reality. And, you know, as you're dialoguing, you're realizing, wow, 
how are we going to change this? You know, wow, your job looks like it's going to be you know pretty hard to change. And wow, I'm doing a lot of family stuff. And wow, we've really gotten some patterns here. How do we get out of these patterns? And it's almost like sometimes when I'm thinking about the difference between vision and reality, I almost get a headache. Literally, I get a headache sometimes when I think about this. And what Peter talked about, and again, Peter, I'm going to have you say more about this in a second, is that you can literally have feelings when you're trying to explore this gap between vision and reality. Uh, you can actually have sadness, hopelessness. You know, there can be all of the worry. Will it ever change? Discouragement. Oh, my gosh, Jana, have we talked about, you know, she's heard me talk about this. I've heard her talk about this. Sometimes trying to make a change like this, I've had some things I've tried to change. You can really feel hopeless. Maybe it will never change. So did any of that happen for you, Jana? And can you talk a little bit about that? And what shifted? What helped 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 you not lower your vision and get and use that those feelings as an opportunity to think more creatively about how to reach for your vision? Anything come to mind? Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting because I had lots of friends. Um, you know, among my group of friends, most of the women worked but their work was more flexible or they made it more flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and they would just kind of say, you know, this is just how it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would just lower their, their vision. And, um, and there was a lot of frustration and ranting and um, venting about that. And yet ultimately the vision was lowered. And, um, for me, uh, I wasn't willing to lower the vision, which meant that I had to figure out a way to change the reality. And one big change for that was realizing that instead of um, kind of venting to my friends, I actually needed to sit down and really talk it out with my partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And many a talks. Sometimes even Many arguments, <laughs> Sometimes yeah. even. but but I think what I'm hearing too is an interesting process of uh, it's in some ways um, when I felt hopeless, uh, talking to a few people helps me get clear about, well, what am I really trying, uh, what, what am I really committed to here to continue to reach for? Um, and then finding the person I need to talk to or the, or the step I need to take, uh, the corrective action that has to happen to hopefully keep that vision just where I want it to be but make the change in the current reality that's uh, required. I'm sure all of us could share lots about this concept. Um, this has been a powerful one for me, Peter. It's, I've used it over and over again. I actually, as part of the Integrated Life Advocate curriculum, I use this whole concept when I talk to people about you know, reaching for change at work, at home. Um, any thoughts you'd like to add, Peter, about the importance of this concept of personal mastery and the creative tension? What would you like to add to that? I think you guys have said it very eloquently. Um, I mean, at some level, at some level, this is always about emotions, mm -hmm. and that's why you know this little little part that you that you cite here, Jessica, the anxiety, the sadness, the anger, the discouragement, the hopelessness, the worry. Um, yeah, that's actually what what happens. The problem starts though with with it usually those kind of quote negative emotions, I mean, we'd probably all regard those as emotions we just assume not experience. So we'd kind of like them to go away. And is a subtle shift in, in focus when your focus becomes how to make the negative emotions go away. Then you do whatever you do to kind of make the emotion go away. You know, obviously one is just to ignore the thing, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll just find a way to anesthetize myself or disengage myself. Just ignore the motion. Or you just dump it, right? Some, one of my colleagues used to say, oh, it's like toxic waste. Yeah. You know, you can either pretend it doesn't exist or you can dump it in the middle of the night. Yeah. Uh, or you learn how to process it. Yeah. Which, which is a, maybe a little bit of a technical way almost to say it, but I think that so much of what it means to mature and grow as a human being is to learn how to process the emotions, not denying them, not just dumping them, but you know, I've got it. I really am angry right now. I am really feeling hopeless right now. I am really discouraged. And there's a little kind of inner choreography here that's unique to each of us 
because these emotions show up in different ways. They trigger different parts of our history. Of yep. course, for many people, these are very difficult because you grew up in a household where there was one or both parents who just lived with this kind of perpetual frustration uh, or even uh, futility or sense of futility or, you know, life really sucks or whatever. Yeah. So we get we get we get hooked into these things. And, and it's a kind of a mundane thing in a way, but it's obviously not true. What does it mean as a human being to see part of our growth? simply being how do we process these emotions how do we acknowledge them let them be there you know from a kind of a technical standpoint we know emotions are physical right yeah I mean, they really do they, they always show up in our body oftentimes we're not paying attention but if we just look a little bit you know the neck stiff the, the belly's tight you know anger will show itself in our shoulders or whatever so there's, there's muscular reactions just to begin to notice about oh, there i am you know i yeah. really my, my neck is, is really tightened up here and I'm really angry. The the curiosity, for me at least, of of the human psyche, or you might say the human consciousness, maybe consciousness more generally, is that when something is really acknowledged and allowed to be, it tends to move. Yeah. It doesn't stay put. Yeah. What keeps it put is ignoring it or 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 somehow pretending it's not there or again, the venting of it, which just kind of reinforces it at some level, as opposed to saying, you know, I really feel hopeless right now. Yeah. It's not, I mean, again, this sounds so simple, but when you're in that state and you can just say, you know, I really feel hopeless right now. I'm, I'm down to doing my hopeless thing right now. Yeah. Somehow, when we can just acknowledge it, it loses some of its energy. The energy from these negative emotions is strong to the extent they're either unacknowledged or we try to cover them up. And if one way, paradoxically, it gives them more energy. If we can kind of stare them in the face and go, ah, this is how I feel right now. Literally, in that instant, the energy around them starts to loosen up. Um, you know, this is the technical part I was referring to. At some level, you know, from the contemplative traditions or meditative traditions, whatever words you like to use. Because they're, you know, they're quite universal around the world. This is the first principle of all contemplative or meditative practice. The first principle is if you can just see the content of your consciousness the act of seeing it makes it tend to move yeah i have a, a wonderful teacher in china who used to say this beautifully particularly when you know people were starting to first learn meditation oh my, my my head is full of thoughts i can't make the thoughts go away and he used to say well your thoughts are pretty much like relatives who stayed too long when they visited the more <laughs> attention you give them the more attention you give them the longer they're likely to stay <laughs> Hard to ignore them, and then they leave. <laughs> that's that's a good one. I'm going to hold on to that one too. <laughs> that's wonderful. And it, again, I have to be this terrible timekeeper role. Uh, role, but I hope what you hear as you're listening in today um, that there is this connection between you know these big actions we can take around you know changing our workplaces, changing what we think about who does what around family that are also very deeply connected to these very, very specific, unique experiences, anger, sadness, hopelessness. And it's all one big part of a big system um, that, that is uh, the process that we need to pay attention to as we're trying to make change. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, just to kind of move us to a place where we can kind of get closer to a wrap up, not because we're ready to wrap up. Uh, you know, what we're trying to say is, that it turns out in today's world where we could work everywhere all the time, where maybe family could take over our lives too, learning to set some thoughtful boundaries around what's the right amount of work, what's the right amount of time for our other life interests, so that we still have some time left over to recharge. Because if you think about it, what what you know both Matt and Jana had to do is have a little time to think, have a little time to be creative even though there was a gap between what they wanted and what their current reality was. And if we don't have that green, that recharge time, I can guarantee you're not going to have time to think in a new way and reach for your goals in a new way. And so, you know, I'm going to give Peter the last word in a second, but the big message is all year long, we're going to be exploring this. Um, you can think differently and influence the system 
of both work and family. Together, our actions are actually the way we're going to make change and create workplaces that are more supportive and create family systems that it's normal for dads to be involved, just like moms. That's, it's our actions. It's our reaching for those goals that are going to actually change these systems. And so that's what we want to talk about this year. We can create an integrated approach to work and life. It doesn't mean we want every family to follow the same approach. We want the families to find the right approach for them. Um, and ultimately, we're hoping that our actions will create better public policy and better supportive organizations. What do you think about all this? What would those, some last thoughts you'd like to share, Peter, um, before I also get a last thought from Matt and Jana? Well, these issues are all deeply personal and they are inherently collective. Yeah. I, I, I think that realizing that when one or a few people start to take a stand in an organization for the things that really matter to them, um, it really does help the organization. Uh, but it also matters how you do it. If you do it out of anger, it won't have as, it won't be as beneficial either for you or the organization. So it's easy to kind of get pretty charged up about these issues, to feel unfairly treated, to feel discriminated against, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but usually then people have to process your anger as opposed to actually realize, no, it's the person who's kind of really thought about what matters to them, has taken a stand, and it's not out of anger. It's just out of clarity. There really is a difference, and it will have a differing impact on the larger organization based on where you're coming from over and above what the particulars of your commitment or choices are. Yeah, yeah, actually I think we've learned, if, there were, if you're gonna take two words away from today's webinar, one was courage, you know, to stand up and ask for something, but I like your word curiosity, uh, to, to come at it from a place of curiosity. Hey, here's yeah. what I'm really reaching for, and it seems like it's hard to get there, and you know, is this what others are interested in? How can we do this? That's, that's what I hear that, you know, that, that was happening in both those households, too. Um, so wonderful. And again, I am going to give us a quick sentence, uh, sec second for Matt to say a, a final thought. I do want to uh, put a plug in and all year long, we really will be ex exploring some exciting topics. And we have a packet of materials we're happy to send you if you put a your address in, the, um, in an email and send it to us. We've created a little packet of materials that kind of really help people think about how to take a next step towards integration this year. Matt, do you have a, a last thought you want to share before we get to Jana? Uh, sure. I think one thing people really need to, to look at when they're thinking about their partnership is that uh, just because you have somebody working with you, uh, I guess, how do you spend the time that you have extra when uh, somebody else takes over some of the load. Do you recharge, as you suggest, or do you pick up a different load? And I right. think that's that's one thing my wife and I are struggling <laughs> with is there's there's lots of stuff that we get done, which allows us to right. relax or it allows us to jump into some other crazy project that yeah. uh, we now have time for. Perhaps that's why my house has not been renovated in so long, Matt, maybe. <laughs> Too much recharge time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for that great point. I, I we all have to keep on making choices. On that's another theme this year. It's that never stops. I think never. I was talking. I had Peter. I think I was talking to you in your office one time, and you're like, "It only stops when you die," or something like that. And I'm like, you know, you're pretty right. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much until that point. <laughs> <laughs> Jana, there might be one last thought you want to share before we wrap up. Yeah, I, I guess um, you know. One thing is when when my partner and I talked about this stuff, we finally came to understand better kind of the workplace system he was, the pressures he was working under, and also the systems I, that were affecting me in, in my kind of world. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it felt easy to say, well, the system is again against us, or there's not enough, you know, cultural or governmental support for this kind of thing. And um, we kept coming back to the idea that, um, you know, it's individuals who who make the system. So yep. we wanted to be individuals who are making our part of the system work for us. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, yep. wonderful. Hey, um, I, I don't know if Peter has to get off the call right now, but I'm going to stop the recording. And then if people have a question they want to ask us, um, I will check with Peter if he can hang out for a couple minutes. But thank you, everybody, for participating in today's webinar. Uh, I knew it was going to be a great uh, subject, and we really covered it so thoughtfully and set up a great year of calls. So thanks, everybody, for participating.